So, uh, good morning. I am Don Fox. I'm a member of our events committee. Uh, and even though our speakers need no introduction, they will get introductions anyway. Uh, I told them yesterday, tell me what you want me to say, otherwise I will make it up. And this is a combination of the two. So, um, <clears throat> Jeff Kenny, who is right behind me, does need no introduction. But for the last, nearly the last quarter century, he's been promoting the culture and history of uh, Culver in various ways. Um, first, uh, here at, at the library, on staff here, um, all the wonderful images and stories of Culver that are now digitized and available online. Well, tens of thousands of those are ones that Jeff painstakingly made available uh, to the public at large. So one of his earlier contributions uh, to, to, to our community. Um, he went on to become, as many of you know, the editor-in-chief of the Culver Citizen, uh, which you get free as part of your, your membership, um, and uh, had a regular column in the, in the Citizen about the history of Culver, uh, I also remember before we came back to Culver and lived in Washington, D.C., he had this wonderful feature about where in the world is the Culver Citizen, and we would make sure and carry our copies wherever we travel uh, and, and get pictures taken of those. Um, so for the last several years, uh, Jeff has been a resident historian uh, for Culver Academies uh, and keeper of the archives uh, across the street. The museum is temporarily closed, but uh, hopes to reopen soon, Jeff tells me. So, uh, and Jeff is a, is a board member uh, of the Culver Historical Society. Uh, the very Reverend Dr. John Houghton uh, is Dean Emeritus of the Alumni Chapel of Hill School in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, uh, and he's Vice President of the Culver Historical Society. Um, <clears throat> he is a cousin of Bayless Dixon, one of the uh, founders of Uniontown in 1844. <coughs> Uh, and John has been speaking and writing uh, about Culver for uh, nearly 50 years of his career. So John's a graduate of Woodcraft, uh, Naval Band, CMA. He holds degrees from Harvard, IU, Yale, Notre Dame. Uh, I have visited three of those schools, and the other one threw my application in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> figure out which one. He has published a, over a dozen academic articles, a book of poetry, and three fantasy novels set on a fictional version of Culver. John and his dog, Theta, of course, live on Bowdoin Street uh, in the house where he grew up here in Culver. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, to our speakers to uh, enlighten us about the mysterious women of Culver and their continuing legacy. So I'm up first here. This is very directional music, not huh? very good. And my first uh, of these legendary ladies is Massaw. She is a Potawatomi, and she's not technically from Culver. She lived in Bruce Lake, but if you don't tell anybody, I, I won't either. Um, for those of you who don't know, Bruce Lake is about 15 miles south of here and a little bit west and is in Fulton County. Uh, confusingly, Bruce Lake was called Kiwana when she lived there, and then, um, the, obviously, the town of Kiwana was founded later and, and a, little bit, a little bit distance away. It was important, the town, the town was important because it became a, a central place for the Indian agent who was in charge of uh, getting trees signed in this part of the state, uh, all of which eventually, of course, were directed at getting the Potawatomi to leave. Um, and so uh, she was married to a French fur trader, her father had been chief before her. Um, she had a little house there, you can actually see it in the back of this picture, uh, a two-story log cabin, and she was enormously wealthy. All these little things on her, her dress are silver discs, so she had, she wore a lot of money and she had a lot of money. Um, so uh, because she had this, this lovely Western-style building, the Indian agent found it an easy place to have meetings because it, you know, it had all the, the home comforts that he was used to, insofar as there were home comforts in the frontier in 1837. We know about Massaw mostly because of the guy who did the painting. This was a character named George Winter, who had been born in England in 1809, uh, came to the States, I guess, in search of adventure, uh, lived for a while in New York, that wasn't adventurous enough, so he moved to Logansport. Which, to tell the truth, doesn't strike as <laughs> 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 
1837, Logan Sport was more of an adventure than it is now, anyway. Um, so he, he lived in Logan Sport just at the right time to record the end of the Miami and the Potawatomi. Uh, he was not, it's not clear whether he was trained as a painter or was self-trained, but in any case, he painted and sketched all this stuff that was happening, including this, this painting of Masson. He also kept a journal, which has been published, and a lot of his uh, photographs, or a lot of his paintings as well. Uh, there are two editions, or two actually different uh, ways of getting at it. This is a collection of the journals and Indian paintings of George Winter that the State Historical Society published back in the 40s. And then there's a, a more recent um, thorough catalog of everything he did, including all the text of his journals. This only has um, the things that the state thought it was appropriate to publish. For instance, the state doesn't publish or didn't publish all the details, but she was apparently really good at euchre. Uh, I would have thought that was a Hoosier distinctive uh, feature, but in any case, uh, her house became the, the, uh, the central uh, feature of all of these, uh, not all, of many of these Indian gatherings. But she herself did rank as a chief desk, I guess is the word. Uh, and for instance, she was involved in signing treaties. One of them is perhaps the most notorious of these treaties uh, of the period. In 1836, the Indian agent was trying to get people to sign treaties that said they would leave in two years. And most of the, uh, the various chiefs did. Menominee, with the reservation up in Twin Lake, famously did not sign the treaty. And apparently, conscious of the fact that he hadn't got a signature, or wasn't going to get a signature, from the guy to whom the reservation had been made, the Indian agent not only got sort of every local Potawatomi he could find, but also chiefs who weren't involved in the negotiations at all uh, to be sort of, I don't know what you'd call them, counter-signatories or something. And Massaw's name is on that list. So she's a, under a separate list that says chiefs of the Wabash Potawatomi, proper chiefs of the Wabash Potawatomi, he's implying that Menominee was not a proper chief. There's a list of these people, including Massaw, uh, under the heading Massaw, his mark. But obviously, it was actually her, not, not him. Um, she had apparently at least a little bit of a sense of humor. On one occasion uh, in this, this month or so in 1837 when Winter was living in her cabin or in her village, um, she brought in a, a, a new Potawatomi chief that he hadn't met. Uh, and she said, this is Yoko Kapton. He's one of our, our chiefs that's you know, come from out of town. Maybe you'd like to do a sketch of him. And so Winter does a sketch of him and it's there in black and white. After which she reveals that it's actually her daughter's French boyfriend and not an Indian at all. <laughs> George Winter, the highly observant art, uh, artist, didn't notice that it was a, a, a white guy and not an Indian that he was drawing. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, she does leave in, in 37, uh, 38, and goes uh, out to, uh, uh, first to Kansas, and then the, the, the tribes move around a little bit, as I'll say in a second. Um, when the Potawatomi when our Potawatomi, so to speak, came to Kansas, they were on the same reservation with a group of Potawatomi who had come there from Illinois. Uh, and they developed different traditions. The, the prairie band, uh, the Illinois folks, decided, okay, we're out here in the land of the, uh, you know, the, the Great Plains Indians. We'll pick up the Plains Indians customs. We'll live like Plains Indians. The Wabash Potawatomi, our Potawatomi, said, you know, we're loyal to the woodlands, we'll keep up our woodland Indian traditions. And so, by the 1860s, there was enough of a tension between the two groups that they decided to split. So the, the, the formerly Indiana Potawatomi uh, had a, a, became parties to a treaty in 1861, which said that, um, if, you, if they wanted to, they could divide their property up household by household rather than owning it communally under, under, as, as, a, as a, a, a tribe. Um, and our Potawatomi signed on for that, and the Illinois Potawatomi remained with, with tribal ownership, which puts the, uh, the Wabash Potawatomi on a, um, a path to citizenship, since they now own property that calls to become citizens, it also put them on the path to being uh, defrauded by tax swindlers over taxes on their, their individual properties. So it turned out to be just one more way for the white guys to take advantage of them. But in any case, uh, 
what this treaty of 1861 is again signed by Massaw, so she's still uh, featuring as a chief of the Wabash Potawatomi in Kansas in the 1860s. The provision of the treaty that allowed for um, uh, individual ownership says, at any time hereafter, the President of the United States, blah, 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 is satisfied that any adults being males and heads of families who may have received an allotment uh, have become sufficiently civilized, then they can become citizens. Massa, as you might imagine, being a signatory to the treaty and a chief, was not impressed with the language that said any adults being males and heads of families. Uh, particularly since she was married to a Frenchman, uh, this would mean that, that she had no chance at all, and her children had no chance at all of getting property because they would have counted as French. So in 1866, there's a revision, uh, and the revision specifically removes the reference to males and makes the property hereditary for either males or females. So if you go to the, uh, as they're now called, the citizen Potawatomi, uh, who were, have since moved to Oklahoma, if you go to the citizen Potawatomi website, you'll find that there is a, a, uh, a recurring theme of praising Massaw as a pioneer of uh, sexual equality, gender equality in the, in the Potawatomi tribe. She does have one further contribution to American history, though, besides her, her uh, role in uh, women's liberation amongst the Potawatomi. Uh, she has two daughters, one of whom was painted uh, by Winter and was also involved in the practical joke that I talked about before. And the second one named Elizabeth, who's born after they get to Kansas. Elizabeth marries a French guy named Jacob View, uh, a half French guy. And they have a daughter named Charlotte. And Charlotte marries a guy named Hiram Thorpe, who is uh, from the Sock, uh, the Sack and Fox family on one side and the Irish on the other. And Charlotte and Hiram Thorpe have several children, including a son named James, somewhat better known as Jim. So this is Jim Thorpe, one of America's most famous Olympic athletes. Oh my God. Right? Uh, and is the great grandson of Massaw. So he's, he has a, a distant uh, Marshall County or Fulton County connection. Yeah. You know, that's odd because we've skipped a slide. Let's see here. Uh, no, it just skipped them entirely. Well, I, as it happens, I can talk about the next person without a slide, and the only danger is that I'll go on a little longer than you might have been interested. <laughs> I would say, when people ask me in, in sermons why I preach a sermon from a text instead of just talking, I say, if I just talk, I'll talk for 43 minutes and assign homework. So. <laughs> um, most of you know probably um, uh, where Patty Stallings lives on uh, Lakeshore Drive, and there's a, a drive running up the hill from her. At the top of that drive, there is a lovely old building that's been redone as a private home. It, and uh, the address is something rather Coolidge Court right at the top of the street there. It was originally a hotel. And it was a hotel owned by a lady named Emma Lord. Emma came here in the 1880s with the trains. Uh, she and her husband had owned a boarding house in Indianapolis that burned. Two people died in the fire. Um, so maybe they were looking to get into a new line of work. But they came up here so that he could run one of the early boat businesses on the lake. Um, and Captain Lord, in fact, ran a, a boat business for two or three years. He had a boat named Lloyd McSheehy, not a famous name except that that guy was the president of the railroad. So there was clearly an attempt to, to curry favor with the right people. Uh, he was apparently kind of a rough character. Uh, he uh, had a couple of bouts with drinking. Um, in one of them, he was actually examined by Dr. Wiseman, who said, you know, it's really not very healthy, but I'm not sure there's much we can do about it. Um, he took, it was in the spring, he took a small boat, uh, actually one of my cousins helped to put the, put the boat in the water, uh, they took a small boat with some clothesline and a um, sash wig, rode down to Long Point, gave himself a fatal wound with a straight razor, having first tied the sash weight to his leg and threw himself overboard. So he, it was gruesome. I've I read the coroner's report. <laughs> uh, so this left... No pictures. No picture. You're not getting pictures, trust me. <clears throat> so Emma Lord uh, was left as a widow. 
she became like Culver's leading business person, male, female, or, or whatever. Um, she was hired to run the Colonnade Hotel in addition to her own hotel. Oh, yes, that's right there. That's yes, right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, Emma runs the Colonnade Hotel for a couple of years. Uh, she continues to run, here we go, she continues to run the boat service, though she doesn't actually captain the boats herself, but she hires the peculiarly named Captain Crook, Oliver Crook, to run the boats for her. Uh, she runs a millinery shop, I think, in Jim Easterday's uh, office across the street here. She eventually bought a pig farm down south of town and ran that for a while. She had a hand in everything. Eventually she had a stroke, and Captain Crook looked out for her. He took her various places from medical treatment to the University of Michigan eventually. Uh, and she came back and, and you know, uh, lasted for another couple of years. Um, when she died, there was a front page, uh, at a description of her death on the Culver City. To be fair, the Culver City only had a front page. But anyway, she was a front page. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it said, Grim Reaper, Grim Reaper visits three homes in Culver. Uh, and so there's two and a half columns about this, this woman's death and the funeral and so on and so forth. And if you go down to the, the older section of the Masonic Cemetery downtown, uh, you can see her lovely uh, or, uh, funeral monument with her dates on it and so on. It was only after this that they discovered that everything about her was a lie. <laughs> she was a complete con woman. Um, what happened was that Captain, so her, uh, she died, and Captain Crook said, well, you know, I bought all these boats from her, uh, I paid an exorbitant price for them, but she promised me that I would get them back in her will. And in fact, I took her will down to the bank and had the bank president, this was the guy before W. Osborne, I had the bank, bank, bank president write up the will, and we left a copy of it on deposit in the bank, just as proof. You can't help thinking Captain Crook knew what kind of woman he was dealing with. Anyway, <laughs> just as proof that it would be there. So, they go down to the bank, the bank president says, well, yes, she did write a will, but she took it years ago. I don't know what happened to it. It turned out that she had destroyed, presumably destroyed the will, presumably because it turned out she'd run the same con with three or four other people in town. <laughs> so there was a line of people that she owed money to, all of whom had been promised that they would get it in the will, and none of them got it because she hadn't left a will. So Captain Crook sues to, to you know, have some kind of justice done. Meanwhile, the administrator of the estate, of the estate sues Captain Crook for the money that's owing on the boats, which he thought he was never going to have to pay because et cetera, et cetera. So there are suits and kinder suits flying back and forth. Everybody is suing everybody. Uh, the attorneys are suing the other attorneys. Everybody's having fun. People are making money. Uh, the properties uh, along Harding Court are being sold off uh, for the benefit of the estate that the big house hasn't been sold off yet. And Captain Crook is going through the, the big house at the top of the hill, and he finds a picture of uh, Emma as a young lady. Scratches his head. He remembers that she had said something once about relatives in Ohio. So he goes to Fort Wayne, for whatever reason, I don't know. He goes to Fort Wayne and hires an attorney, the son of a former uh, judge up in Plymouth, and says, see if you can find this lady's relatives in Ohio. I don't know how many doors he knocked on, but he eventually found a door where he said, this is Emma Sewell Lord, do you recognize her? And they said, well, we recognize her, but that's not Emma still, uh, uh, still Lord, that's our cousin Susie, whatever that is. <laughs> um, so uh, he tracks her down. It turns out that she uh, was, her entire background, including her, the year of her birth was, was fabricated. But she had been married to a guy named, the important part, she had married, married to a guy named Brewer and had a daughter. And they had all moved to Indiana from Ohio. So he goes to India, Indianapolis and looks around and yeah, people maybe remember, well, they don't know. But the daughters and, and the daughter's father, uh, uh, was not Mr. Lord, uh, they're a known quantity in you know this, this little town that no one's ever heard of north of Indianapolis. I, you know, the, it's, uh, oh gosh, what in the heck is the name of the place now? Um, no, 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 it's, it's, it, it actually is one of the suburbs. But um, she, uh, so he goes there, finds the daughter, and says, you know, was your mother 
Estelle from Ohio, and she says, well, yeah, actually she was. Uh, you know, we don't talk about it, but that, that's right. <laughs> my, my dad is still alive. And he says, you might want to come back with me to, to uh, India, to uh, Culver, Indiana, because there are a few lawsuits going on that you might be a party to. So this daughter appears, more or less out of thin air, and the court in Plymouth is, is duly amazed, uh, and everybody now sues her, and she sues everybody because they were, but she was the legitimate heir, and they were giving away her mother's property without having found her, so eventually the judge appoints her the administrator of whatever is left, and she settles with, with uh, Crook and the other people, uh, and you know, rides off into the sunset with her son, her father, and whatever cash was left out of the estate. So. <laughs> My third lady, we do have video, I have a picture for That's not her in the picture. <laughs> uh, this is the subject of a book here in the, the library called Frieda's Lachen. And I, I have to tell you that it, this book covers more dirty laundry than L.G. Good and Best Pure saw in their entire career at the Academy. Uh, I would not have written this book about my family, and I know some stories about my family, but nonetheless. <laughs> Uh, this is the, the, these are the in-laws of Ace Bird, whom some people here may have known. This is him retiring. He had been uh, a, a head waiter at the uh, Max and Kentucky Inn and Palmer House uh, and eventually in the, the dining hall, uh, and then had come back for years to work in the Woodcraft camp as the head janitors because he liked coming back to Culver for the summers. Uh, so that is it. That's why Pete Trone is in the background there in his Woodcraft uniform and Dean Benson on the right-hand side, uh, giving oh, his, his uh, yeah. reward. Uh, uh, Ace and his wife lived down on Hawkins Court, uh, down in the, the south end of town, uh, and Vandalia Street was uh, carved out of their property. In fact, they, they, they vacated Vandalia Street to the town. So that's, that's the neck of the woods. Um, she lived to be 104, 105, something like that, uh, and died uh, in 1994. So. Uh, some of you may have known Elsie Bird, or at least seen her, her obituary when, when she did die. Uh, but it's, it's Elsie's family that are involved in the story, so I can, I can advance to the next slide. Elsie has a brother named uh, Bruce, and they're from Chicago, but Bruce is, has gone to look for work, and he's found a job in New York delivering coal. Typical job for you know, a young black man from, from Illinois going off to the big, to an even bigger city than, than Chicago. There is a young lady named Frida, uh, Federica Mariana Charlotte Brierly, who has come to the U.S. to live with her brother uh, from uh, Bremerhaven in Germany. Uh, and she has brought with her from Germany a locket with pictures of her parents, hence the title Frida's Locket. So she comes to New York, you know, a young woman full of expectations about uh, New York, the streets are paved with gold, blah, blah, blah. And she ends up spending most of her time living in her brother's house, taking care of her brother's kids. She, not that she doesn't like her brother's kids, but it's kind of a closed-in life. So whom should she meet but the guy delivering the coal, who is Bruce Miller. <coughs> Excuse me, Bruce Miller. Uh, and they strike up a romance, uh, and eventually uh, strike up a baby. <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's, it, this is the 19, uh, this is 1912, uh, the uh, Briarly family are not happy to have their daughter marrying the, the black guy who delivers the coal. Uh, so the two of them get married and go back to Illinois, uh, where they live in Chicago with uh, Florence Miller, the, the mother, and uh, a brother and a sister and a, and a nephew. They're there for a couple of years, and um, I mean, they don't like Chicago. It's crowded. It's noisy. It's dirty. Whatever. They don't have Franco mints. Um, <laughs> so Bruce hears from his sister Elsie, and Elsie says, "You know, I live in this this lovely town here in in, in Indiana. We're right on the lake. Uh, it's a lovely place to raise children. Why don't Ma and?" sister and brother and you all come down to, to live in Culver. So they do. Now, an element of this to which I, I'm not sure we would necessarily 
pay attention, but would have been, which they would have been conscious at the time, is they're not married in Indiana, right? Interracial marriages in Indiana were illegal until the 1960s. So um, this was a law that was widely disregarded. No one was going to pick them up and charge them a thousand dollar fine, but it does. I think I think it comes into the story later on. In any case, they come here. Uh, Bruce works in the uh, the dining hall for a while. World War I comes along, he's drafted, uh, he and his brother are both drafted, in fact, they serve in the war, they come back, and after the war, Ace notices that Bruce is not uh, holding up very well to his job in the dining hall. He's having trouble holding things, uh, he has trouble concentrating, um, so eventually he can't work for the school anymore, and then eventually he can't work anymore. And by 1923, I think it is, um, He's completely demented, uh, and in fact tries to attack his wife. Uh, so uh, he, his mother actually testifies for his committal proceedings. Uh, he's briefly uh, put into the, the state mental hospital in South Bend, the regional one, and then he goes to the VA in, uh, in Marion County. It turns out that he has Huntington's disease, uh, and in fact, uh, most of the Millers did. Uh, his brother develops it, and his children and grandchildren as well. So this is uh, familiar from Woody uh, Guthrie, for those of you who remember him having the same disease. So dementia, violence, uh, uh, physical uh, lack of coordination. This is what it was called, Huntington's chorea, because it was like you were dancing, is the, the chorea word. Um, in any case, so Frida is left at home uh, with her, her, I remember she had at that time, uh, four kids, I guess. Uh, raising them here in Culver and living in her home, uh, partly protected by Ace and Elsie. She develops a second romance uh, with a, a guy who, at least according to her granddaughter, uh, with a guy who is a um, barber here in town. And so Ace goes to the barber and says, you know, you can't just keep hanging out with my sister-in-law, either uh, marry her or don't marry her, but, but I'm not going to put up with this sort of nonsense. So the guy leaves town. <laughs> um, Frida, meanwhile, gets a job with Mrs. O'Callaghan. Uh, so this is uh, Nathan England's mother, right? Um, uh, working o over at the academy, being a housekeeper and so on, and it's, it's a, you know, helps her keep uh, body and soul together, though uh, apparently uh, Bird's uh, colleagues from the dining hall would bring food home as well, and other ways of helping her. A young widow, well, not a young widow, but a young woman on her own with four children, five children, um, uh, get by. Working for Mrs. O'Callaghan, on some occasion, Mrs. O'Callaghan needs something fixed around the house. And so she sends over to the school, and they send the academy blacksmith over to fix what bit of ironwork it is that needs to be fixed. This guy comes, and Frida falls in love again. <laughs> Uh, the difference uh, this time is that the Academy blacksmith is a guy from um, what's it, uh, Tyosa, right down in, uh, outside outside Rochester, uh, and is a significantly a, a white guy rather than a black guy. So uh, by 1930, they have a daughter, uh, and then uh, a second child expected in 19 in September of 1933. So in August of 1933, they get married. Um, it's not, there's no record in Marsha kind of getting a divorce, they might have been divorced, I mean, of uh, her getting divorced from her husband who's in the state hospital. Uh, she might have gotten a divorce in Fulton County, but it's also possible that she wasn't able to get a divorce because, again, in Indiana, they'd never been legally married yeah. to begin with. <laughs> in any case, she, she remarries this, uh, she marries <coughs> the, this guy from, uh, from Fulton County, um, and leaves all of her children with Elsie and Ace, uh, and says, you know, I don't want to see them again, or at least I, I can't raise them. She doesn't say I want to see them, I can't raise them. Elsie says, if you're not going to, if you expect me to raise them, then you're not going to see them again. Uh, and so Elsie goes to court and, and is appointed the administrator, the, the uh, guardian of the kids. Um, and after that, Frida really doesn't have anything to do with them. Uh, when the kids grow up, uh, one of them gets in touch with her and she says, well, we'll take the Indiana motor bus up to South Bend and I'll meet you on the bus and we can talk in South Bend. So that, that she doesn't want to be seen 
with plentiful of biracial children any place in, in the immediate area. Um, and in fact, she stops going by her first name. You'll see that, that she, on her tombstone, she's just Mariana Charlotte. She stops even using Frida as a way of, of, con of concealing her relationship to her first family and her first children. So after, her, after she dies, uh, Paul is grand, the author of this book, uh, her grandmother, her mother comes rather, to meet her, her half relatives. Uh, and they're not, I mean, they're persuaded, but they, this is all news to them. They didn't know their mother had a first family, a first husband, much less biracial cousins. Um, and so as they're discussing this, one of um, Frida's children from her first marriage says, well, you know, Mama used to have this locket. I remember that I broke it when I was little. Uh, and so the other family says, oh, we have a locket. So they bring out the locket, and sure enough, it's the same one. It's still broken the same way. So Frida's locket provides the, the evidence that these two families are actually related to each other. So there you go, Frida's locket. Uh, it's here in the library. You can read it for yourselves. Thank you, and Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, so it is. It is quite the read. Um, so I made it uh, couple, just a quick note on this program: we started out really looking at these two women um, as the centerpiece of the program. Two women who um, were really pretty criminal, and John described one of them. And then we just in conversing, and I and I want to credit Carol Saff for sitting back there. We had some good conversations that led to expanding this to some really interesting people uh, beyond just people who are you know criminally. <laughs> Etc. So I'm gonna. Here's gonna be the thing. I have this fun little video clip, and it's always a challenge to do me talking through a mic and the video audio. So I'm gonna see if I can make it work, but I apologize if it doesn't. We're gonna try. Went backwards. Did I go backwards? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's so bad. Give me a second. I'm gonna. I'm gonna fix the audio. So there's the there's the you know million dollar question. Whatever happened to Carl Steely? Um, <clears throat> in this story, in this story, we know what happened to Carl Steely. But um, that is Bonnie Bedelia playing the role of uh, she has a long name, but we're just going to call her Jill Coit. That uh, Doogie Hauser MD there, Neil Patrick Harris, is playing her son. He's going to play a, a major role in the story. I guess I have a clicker done. Yeah. Um, so this is, so first of all, Carl Steely up at the left. Many of you know him, heard a lot of recognition. Uh, he was a Marine Corps veteran who served Culver Academies for more than 30 years from 1966 to 99 in numerous positions, including counselor, instructor, academic dean, development officer, admissions officer, as well as commandant of cadets for three different stints in the 70s and 80s, which is, I think it's, he's unique in that role at the academy. No one else has had three different stints. Um, he uh, taught, Later on, he would talk about his Marine Corps training, uh, preparing him for many things, but not for the likes of Jill Coit. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, he had been a former pastor. He actually had his own church in Kentucky at one point, and he was impressed, this is the, one of the ironies, of Jill's deep knowledge of the Bible, among uh, many other interests they seemed to share. Their conversations began in relation to her son's schooling. Um, both her sons attended Culver Academies, at least for a bit. Uh, one graduated. The two grew quite close and were married on campus at the chapel in January of 1983. Unbeknownst to him, she was married to two or three men by that time. We don't really know exactly how many. Uh, by the time of her arrest for the murder of Jerry Boggs, her name technically was, I'm going to get some of this wrong, Jill Lonita Bilio 
in hen more coit brody de rosa metzger steely box <laughs> impressive um jill Bill, is it bilio 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 she was originally from louisiana so french uh from louisiana and first married uh, after dropping out of high school she married a second husband and filed for divorce soon after that she married William Coit in 1966 while still married to her second husband. He was shot in the back and killed, allegedly by an intruder, in 1972, though police suspected Jill. They never were able to prove uh, you know, that she committed the murder. Shortly after that, she persuaded a wealthy older man to adopt her in California and inherited a great deal of his wealth when he died soon thereafter, not, not, of, not under suspicious circumstances. Just, he was old. Um, she married another man. She married another man for two more years, prior to twice marrying and twice divorcing one of the attorneys who represented her in the investigation of William Coit's murder. Uh, still legally married to her fifth husband, she married Eldon Metzger in Ohio, and in 1983 she married Carl Steele. <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> Sorry. Jill's marriage to Carl lasted longer than most, so, you know, points for, points for them. Uh, <laughs> but it ended in a bitter divorce with a number of messy financial entanglements. I won't go into all that. Uh, Carl also believes she tried to kill him later in their marriage. They lived, of course, at this house in the upper left there, which still stands um, quite you know, lovely today, on Lakeshore Drive. Um, they're near Lake Street. Uh, so he, Carl believes she tried to kill him at least twice. Uh, once, uh, she, apparently she never made his morning coffee, but one morning she made a point of going back around the house, coming and making the coffee, and that day he passed out while, uh, while at the school. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, and then once by hiring someone to run over him uh, while riding his bicycle in Culver. I've heard a couple different accounts. That's the one that's in one of the books. Um, and, and, I mean, thank, thank goodness he's alive. I mean, it, it, we're, we're laughing, but I mean, I know if, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, so, thankfully, he, he survived. By 1991, and again, she's still married. Uh, she's still married. I'm not sure that, well, no, the divorce hadn't been finalized. By 1991, she's living in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and would eventually marry eighth husband, Gerald Boggs, Jerry Boggs. Um, even before things got worse, uh, Boggs' brother was suspicious, and he hired a private investigator uh, who unearthed her entire life as a complete scam, uh, from businesses to marriages, and their marriages and all. I'm skipping a lot of detail. Uh, <laughs> she had all kinds of crazy business things going on, including in Wabash, Indiana, where she told the police she'd been tied up and struck and robbed, and of course she filed insurance claims on her stuff. Uh, so she was really, she was interesting. Um, Jeff, yeah. was the Boggs the one that owned the hardware store in Colorado yes. where all that yeah. happened? Yeah, 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 he was. Um, so she briefly married a ninth time before starting a relationship uh, with Michael Backus and convincing him to help her murder Boggs. So in October of 1993, they murdered Boggs and fled to Mexico. Jill's son, Seth, went to the police after she confided in him about the murder. And he and his brother, William's courage, were essential as there was no physical evidence to convict her. That's why this movie, movie is called Legacy of Sin. I know you're all, it's on YouTube. You don't need to go home and watch it. Um, it's uh, the one I showed you the clip from. And it focuses much more on him because it really was a difficult, there's a whole long story on their sons. I mean, you know, we're trying to kind of keep this moving, but... Um, I know my mentor, a historian at the academy, oh gosh, 15, 20 years ago, did a program just on this in that house uh, and went into a lot more detail. Somewhere maybe there's a recording of that. But, um, so, so at any rate, there's, there's quite a lot more to it. But the sons were so instrumental. There really was no physical evidence linking her to the murder, a lot of circumstantial evidence, but it was the son's testimony that convicted her. So, you know, hence the film focusing on, on him and them. Um, Evidence and testimony in her 1995 trial. Uh, she'd begun making plans to murder Boggs as early as the summer of 93. She was convicted of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit the first degree murder and sentenced to life without possibility of parole, plus an additional 47 years on the conspiracy charge. She's still alive. Um, Michael Backus was also convic convicted and sentenced to life. Um, she's currently serving her sentence at Denver Women's Correctional Facility. Anybody wants to? Is it her right? Um, all of, there she is. All of her appeals have been exhausted. Um, she has repeatedly attempted to find a new husband via the internet. So again, okay. just saying. Um, there, as you can see, there, there are a couple of pot boiler you know, uh, books written about her. She's been featured in a number of documentaries. I mean, you know, the dark well, here's. Is this a, this is a movie? Okay. Nice. Okay.
Okay, so we'll have to check this one out. She mates and she kills. Black Widow. <laughs> Phenomenal film. Um, so, so that's the story of Jill Coit. Definitely, um, she was known as Black Widow. Um, I would say, yeah, really one of the most um, prominent of these kinds of things to, to, to happen in Culver. Um, you know. So, you know, going from the infamous to more positive, um, you know, more positive stories of some of these little-known ladies. So Irene Eleanor Tash Hofer, a name I think a lot of people um, here probably don't know, and I want to credit Cheryl Fujimura, a lot of you know Cheryl. She came into the museum some months ago and, and showed me an obituary of Irene uh, Hofer, and we were all kind of astounded at this. Um, she's born in Chicago, grew up with her parents, two older brothers, Philip and Kenneth, and their three sisters, uh, Lorraine, Marilyn, and Maxine, on their farm near Culver. Um, kind of close, you know, in the Monterey, Culver, kind of, you know, close to. Uh, the family endured a lot of hardship when the eldest brother, Philip, was killed in Normandy during World War II, and her father also passed away at an early age. Um, in fact, uh, if, you, if you're familiar at all, the Monterey American Legion post is the um, Collins Tash post, so that's Tash, that's Philip Tash. So that's, you know, that's where they get their, their American Legion post name. She had a real aptitude for mathematics, Irene did, and an intense interest in astronomy, space travel, and aeronautics, or sorry, astronautics. Um, her fascination with rocketry led her to enroll in the School of Aeronautics and uh, Astronautics at Purdue, which was an unconventional choice for a woman in the 1950s. She was the sole woman to graduate from her program in 1958, and she was recruited to the missile test facility, uh, to a missile test facility in California, where she worked as an aeronautical engineer. So, I mean, very early for her to be doing this. Soon after this, she met her future husband, George Hofer, and they had two daughters. Uh, her work took her to remote locations that included Midway Island and Trinidad, as well as domestic rocket launch sites uh, in places like Cape Canaveral. She spent uh, a lot of time working at the Pacific Missile Range Facility in uh, Hawaii, where she developed a great affection for all things Hawaiian. Um, although she faced, and this I'm quoting her obituary here, although she faced some adversity during the early days of her career as one of the few women in the aerospace field, she was quite dedicated and continued to work until just shy of her 80th birthday. She was a member of Sigma Xi Scientific Research Society, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and she died unexpectedly at age 89 on October 28, 2021. Um, there's actually an Irene E. Hofer STEM scholarship fund uh, that one could donate to, but you know, she just so, so it's, real, it's a really interesting, unknown, you know, how did we not know? Someone, uh, just sort of a quiet figure uh, from the Culver area, went on to do these things. So Jeff, I'm sorry, yeah. but how did how what's the connection with Cheryl? Did you know? No, nothing except that Cheryl found the obituary, and I'm just I'm just thanking no. her for pointing this out because how I she never. She was from Culver and brought that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She she okay. noticed the story, and um, otherwise I I've never seen anything about her other than this obituary. Did she go to Trinity High School? She did. She graduated Culver High School, and I'm trying to remember what year. Um, she graduated Purdue 58, so it was in the 50s. But um, Tash, T-A-S-C-H, and again, if you know that American Legion, there's her brother's name. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's right. Jenny Tash had a business name. That's what it was. Jenny Tash, yeah, Car, yeah, Car, yeah, Ken Tash. So that would have been her brother. Yes, thank you. That's a, I should have had that. Yeah. This is quite an interesting story. It's, it's a little genealogically complicated, but I think you'll see a lot of things you recognize in the story, a lot of people you recognize in the story. It begins with the fellow on the left there, Major Charles E. Reed. He's a graduate of Jefferson Medical School in Philadelphia, and he had served as a medical missionary in China in the early 1900s, and in 1911 he became a, a surgeon and a lecturer at Culver Military Academy. Uh, he served until his death on New Year's Eve 1928, so he was still working when he died suddenly. Um, he had been the president of the PTO here in Culver. He'd been in the Chamber of Commerce uh, as a board member, so he was really involved in the community as well as, you know, at the academy. Um, so his son, the one of five, um, Dr. Donald Reed, was a graduate of Culver Military Academy in 1918. Uh, he served in the Air Corps in World War II and served as a physician in town in Culver. So, uh, so some of you will know right away, what street was his office on? 
College, College Avenue. Avenue. Yep, it's a private home today across the street. I was, delivered. I was delivered in that house. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Proof that I'm not making this up. Uh, so, um, so he served at, in that role in College Avenue as uh, one of Culver's prominent physicians for nearly 30 years. He died in 1961, also suddenly at age 60. Um, his nephew, Dr. Donald W. Reed, continued in his practice. He served six years in Culver. Uh, he died in 2012, having moved and been a doctor in central Indiana after that. Um, Donald W.'s father, so this is the nephew's father, and this is Donald W. up here, um, and Dr. Donald in the middle, who delivered babies on College Avenue. Um, um, Do Donald W.'s father, so the nephew up here, his father uh, was... Uh, Arthur Reed, Charles Arthur Reed. He was uh, he worked at the post office in Culver, and Arthur Reed's daughter, um, by the way, was uh, I don't know, was Winifred Joyce. So some of you may remember oh, Winifred Joyce. Yeah. She was my neighbor growing up, and babysat me sometimes. Um, she served for oh, over thirty years in Culver's EMS. I think she was one of the founding members of it, but if not, very early on, she died in twenty eighteen. So there's a lot of these sort of you know little tentacles that connect to each other that bring us to the feature part of the story, um, Emily, Emily Reed is the daughter of our original guy over here, Dr. Charles Reed, the surgeon at the academy. She's born in 1911. She's actually born in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, but she, owned, she lived there maybe not even a whole year. She attended Culver Elementary Middle School, and then she was sent to Miss Frances Schreimer, Schreimer's Girls School in Mount Carroll, Illinois, which really was a college, but they also had a high school program for girls at the time. Uh, really interesting. That's her yearbook picture from the Girls Academy there in Illinois. Uh, she attended Ohio Wesleyan, Indiana University, and the University of Michigan. And you can see just these are little clippings from the Culver Citizen. She was quite involved in all sorts of academic things while she was in Culver. If she, is, she gets a bit older. She worked at Florida State University, the Detroit Public Library. She also was in Hawaii uh, at, uh, she was at the Public Library in, I'm going to mispronounce it, Kaui? Thank you. I'm obviously, I'm not a, a Hawaiian aficionado. Um, and the State Library Agency of Louisiana. After leaving Louisiana, Miss Reed was appointed director of the Alabama Public Library Division in 1957. Soon after she assumed the directorship, uh, this book becomes a central part of the story. This book is published in 1958, The Rabbit's Wedding. So the, the author and artist of this book is Garth Williams. If you don't know who Garth Williams is, if you're not like me and haven't read the entire Little House of Prairie series to your kids four times, which I have, um, Garth Williams illustrated the versions most of us know of the Little House of the Prairie books. Um, so those are those kind of charcoal sketch you know, things. So Garth Williams does this book, The Rabbit's Wedding, and as you can get a better version of it, uh, you can sort of surmise uh, these rabbits have a wedding, and one is white and one is black. So this is a problem in Alabama in 1958. Um, even though they're rabbits. Um, so, you know, um, so, segregationist legislators in Alabama, especially Senator E.O. Eddins, begin to scrutinize the collections of the library agency. It wasn't just that book, but lots of books. Attacking uh, the holding as integrationist and communistic uh, for the, some of the books that were in it. Um, this becomes kind of a national story. You can see this headline, Sen Senator Eddins declares the rabbit's wedding should be burned. So obviously they are reading into this, this story about the rabbits, um, human things, right? They're anthropomorphizing, I didn't just do that wrong, uh, the animals into humans. So yes, black, black rabbits and white rabbits shouldn't marry. Uh, the White Citizens Council gets involved, um, and they really, they really go hard after Emily um, in, this, in, this, in this complicated, that's not that complicated, in this situation. So the library system banned the book from all libraries in Alabama. So Emily said she enjoyed the book, and she did comply to the extent that she moved it out of general circulation, but uh, so it was available upon request, and refused to ban the book. So this is a quote from her, we have had difficulty with the book, but we have not lost our integrity. So her, her, her position was, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take it off the front shelf, but we're not going to comply. Uh, before the year was over, segregationists again found fault with Emily Reed, who distributed a reading list that included various controversial titles, including Martin Luther King Jr.'s book, Stride Toward Freedom. Um, so I would, I would suggest, and John was just talking about our thriving 
black community in Culver at the time. And of course, that features on the sign that Patty referenced. Um, the 1922 basketball team, Culver High School basketball team, <coughs> included two black players, uh, last names Witted and Wade, who um, there's a whole story that we won't go into about them. But we, for a long time, we thought that was the earliest integrated high school basketball team in Indiana, per the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. But we have found one other school, at least, that, that has an earlier, uh, earlier in, in Indianapolis, earlier team, but still one of the earliest. So we're looking at a historical marker, kind of like the one at 10 and uh, Queen Road, out, um, you know, east of town, that would not only mark that, but mark Herman Sager, who is also Sheriff for Jamura's uncle, um, that, that who, who holds the record for the most points scored in one basketball game, and also invented the three-point shot. So that's, again, another program another day. But um, I, I bring these, these folks up because Emily is going to school with a number of you know, uh, peers who were, who were from Culver's, you know, again, re rather thriving black community. So is that an impact on, on Emily? We, besides her parents, certainly, um, we assume so. And you can see this reflected, well, let me just finish her story. In 1960, she left Alabama to become a consultant with the library system in Washington, D.C., where she worked for six years. She retired in 1977 uh, from a library in Baltimore, and she died in 2000. In its 2000 midwinter meeting, the American Library Association's Intellectual Freedom Committee resolved to, quote, recognize and applaud Emily Reed's courageous stand, unquote. Uh, she, uh, she had been a charter member of the Freedom to Read Foundation and a member for 61 years of the American Library Association. So, you can see where these obituaries, just Google her, uh, and you'll see the New York Times, the Washington, <clears throat> excuse me, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, she's written up all over the country uh, because she uh, took the stand against um, the segregationists in 1958-59. And in fact, I was contacted, I can't remember exactly what year, but I was contacted by a playwright named Kenneth Jones who had written a play called Alabama Story. He had read her obituary and in 2015, he wrote a play uh, called Alabama Story, uh, once again, uh, which had its world premiere in January 2015 in Salt Lake City, Utah. By the summer of 2023, uh, it, had been, it had been produced in at least 45 cities since its premiere, including Indianapolis. Um, Kenneth Jones is a New York City playwright. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is it's, it's kind of interesting. And it's all about, it's not entirely about Emily Reed, but obviously she's the centerpiece of the play, uh, I've not seen the play, but um, I was able to provide the playwright with a lot of information about her Culver upbringing because he really didn't know anything about her childhood. What what would bring her to that point in 1958 that she's kind of taking this position? And again, we can't, you know, we don't know that for sure. But it was it was it was interesting to be able to communicate with him and you know share a lot of the information I just shared with you about her background. So which again he didn't have. So yeah. Emily Reed, kind of I think a happy ending to our. <laughs> Six uh, little-known ladies, and uh, I, I just think we, we, we have a lot. There's always new stories. We're always finding new information. So that's what I have. And questions for anyone? Tell how many points the basketball players. Was it 127? I, I think I think he scored 115. Excuse <clears throat> me. On the top of my head. Off the top of my head, I think he scored 115, and there were 120 some scored in the game total. Keep <laughs> on uh, strong. If you if you're used to the um, apartment building on Pearl Street, immediately behind uh, the the uh, Lake View Lake whatever we're calling that that restaurant this week. Um, uh, thank you, Lake House. Uh, that was the actual gym at the time. Uh, the, the school didn't have a gym, and so there's a meeting room on the second floor. Uh, and that was the place where all these things happened. But obviously, if you put a monument there, no one would ever see it. So the, the sign is going next to the school, even though the games were played in the, on Pearl Street. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's great. Is Carl Steely still alive? He passed away, oh gosh, what year? Um, it's not been that long ago. He was honored quite a bit in, in a, you know, a school after he passed away. His, his son posted a, a picture of his tombstone just this morning, but I, I can't find it that time. Yeah. But if you go into our digital vault, it's, it's called Virginia Digital Vault, which is what I originally started doing over there at the school. Um, there's there's quite a bit in the, of tribute to him after he died. I want to say 2015, 2012, somewhere in there. And Sorry, was he not he remarried? Adam yes, he did remarry. Yeah. Yes. And then they moved away from Culver. Yes. Yeah. Okay. He he had moved away by the time he passed away. Yep. Carol she was Carol. Wasn't her name? Yeah. Yeah. How many children did they have? 
Uh, do you mean Steely? Yeah. Before he married yeah. Jill? Yeah. To who? Yeah, there was a daughter. Is it just two? Daughter and son. Daughter and son. I think Chris, Chris is the son. I forgot the daughter's name. I forgot my name. I think he had four children. I thought he had four children. I think he had four children. Because I have four. But there, oh. Yeah, I four sounds more right to me. I know of the two, but I, I don't know the other two. But I should know that stuff, but I don't have a lot of right. But I do think you're right. I think it's, I think four is right when you say that. Yeah. Dif different family. Different different spelling. Yeah. Ran the movie theater. Yeah, that's a different yeah, so he's E E L and they are I want to say they're they would you might say it's Staley, but it's S T A H. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I was just wondering about this play, uh, whether anybody in Columbus could maybe put it on. Yes, I'm I, I this you know COVID happened after all this started, all this flurry of conversation about this, so it kind of went to the wayside, in my mind at least. But uh, there's a new theater director, recent, fairly recent theater director at the Academy. One of the challenges with it, and it's not a bad thing, but it's, it's like six actors. So if you're doing a school play, yeah. it's not as conducive. Um, you know, you want more kids on the stage, and I think that's why, because um, the previous theater director looked at it and didn't kind of didn't bite on it, and, and so, I think it may have been there just aren't enough kids to get involved, but it could be a great community theater project. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I do. How many acts does it have? I'm not sure. You know, I was just wondering Two acts. There's three acts. Two acts. Two acts. Different people That's right there. Play the, uh, each act. That would be good. Yeah. Jenny just noticed it says two acts. This is now the two act ball. Alabama story. Two acts, yeah. So I mean, and you could do things like one night at one cast, and yeah, it's yeah, you know. But uh, so yeah, there. I'll, you know, I'm I'm gonna pass this along to, you know, those folks. But yeah, I mean, maybe someone wants to use the Reese in Plymouth to do it. Too. <laughs> you, I have to say, if you haven't been to the Reese, I hadn't been uh, until not that long ago. So it is amazing. I mean, they have done a phenomenal job. Renovating that old movie theater, and it is just—it's a total win. I mean, yeah. And forget they are doing a play uh, later this week. I think twenty second, twenty third, twenty fourth, twenty fifth. Steel Magnolias, and it's Magnolia. done by yeah. Yeah. So two afternoons and two evenings. And aren't the Mexicaki players performing? Uh, you know, being up there this summer. Yeah. At, at the I, I think yeah. so. It yeah. is yeah. an unbelievable yeah. thing. The only things we get to promote. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jimmy, are you saying that it's not the movie? The movie was shown there, but the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th, it's a local theater group putting on the play, still yeah. Magnolia. So oh, 2 o'clock yeah. and 7, but I'm not sure which day, what day. Here, I'm just plugging the heck out of them, but if you get on, you can follow them on Facebook. They're doing a lot up there, and so that's how I, yeah, they're featuring their actors and all that. Yeah. What is the name of this playwright? Kenneth Jones. Okay. Kenneth Jones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll come back. Oh. The Reese Theater. Yeah. Um, we hear so many different stories. What has happened there? You mean the one at Culver? Not the Reese. I mean the Culver. Oh. That's a. Uh, uh, well, so the owner of it who had started to kind of get the wheels turning on renovating it passed away earlier this year. Um, he's also the person who made the Vonnegut House happen. Uh, so that you know, that's that was a sh kind of a shock and a shame. But um, so I don't know where that will go. Um, his sister, I believe, is the inheritor of it. So we'll we'll see. Not sure. Yeah, I mean, it, the ugly thing about it is the marquee, you know. But that's really a minor. You know, I mean, it's it's sad. But I mean that. We look at it and go, oh my gosh, it's terrible. But the, the, really, the marquee is the ugliest thing on it. So whether what the structure of it is, that's another. Yeah, yeah that's another question. So. I, my uncle played on that basketball team. I bet that's. I, I bet I bet several people have family in here, but that's interesting. He's uh, so he's in the. Uh, yeah. He's in the picture. Last guy. Which one? Roy. Roy Oppenheimer. Oh, he's the. He's the top guy. He's the captain. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Did he get 150 points? <laughs> <laughs> that was a different year, okay? <laughs>
the rules change. The rules change after that. Um, any other questions for anyone? Probably. Okay.